All right, let's get started for today. I know a lot of you have a midterm for CS170 tonight. Um, a lot of you are currently studying for it, I think. I uh, hope it went well once you watch this video. Um, so a couple of announcements for 188. Um, on Monday, we have our second midterm. There is a room assignment based on last names. The topics are lectures 12 through 21. So we're not asking you anything about lectures one through 11, just 12 through 21. Of course, also the corresponding homework, projects, and so forth. There's a prep page which has past exams. Um, there are special midterm two office hours, so check those out. There's a lot more office hours this week than any other week. Um, there's a practice midterm. This is to see how well prepared you are. Um, this is due on Saturday, this is optional. If you complete it, um, you get one point of extra credit on the actual midterm. Um, the reason it's due on Saturday is that it'll give you some time on Sunday and Monday to continue to prepare for the midterm in case the practice midterm didn't go so well. Any questions about the logistics for midterm two? Okay, so next week, what will it look like? Um, Monday, there will be office hours as posted on the edX page and the exam itself. And on Tuesday, there's no lecture, no section, no exam prep session, no office hours. We'll be grading your exams and you'll have nothing scheduled for 188. Um, on Wednesday, there'll also be no office hours, no section, no exam prep session. Then on Thursday, there will be lecture again and office hours will resume, but still no section, no section the entire week. And on Friday, there will also be normal office hours. All right, so one thing that will go out on Monday the day of your midterm is the final contest. The final contest is a Pac-Man game where you get to program AI for several Pac-Man to play against another team where it's a bit like a capture the flag kind of contest. You would play one side, for example, you might play uh, red side and you would have to go collect food pellets on the other side. On your own side, you are a ghost. On the other side, you are a Pac-Man. And very similar to what happened in the contest for project two, you have to eat all the pellets on the other side, up to maybe a couple, and bring them back. Now, there'll be a few differences from the contest after project two. Um, there will be pow special powers like there were at the end of project four. So you will be thrown into some random draw, which might be chosen by the other player to some extent. You'll run inference based on some observations, then hopefully find out what kind of world you're in, and then you'll actually get to choose power pellet types that you can plant on the other side based on what you know the other side's powers are. So if the other side has a power that you can counter with a particular counter power, you'd want to drop power pellets of that type so you can counter their capabilities. Um, so that's the setup. Logistically how it's set up, we're releasing on Monday. You can do this in uh, groups of up to two students. Um, we're releasing it on Monday. Then from Monday through Tuesday, the week after, there will be a leaderboard that's continuously up, but every night we'll run a bunch of games to make that leaderboard converge. Um, there'll be achievements based on that. For example, have you beaten one staff bot, multiple staff bots, all staff bots? Um, where are you ranked? Are you in the top 10 on any given night and so forth? Based on those achievements, there will also be extra credit. Extra credit directly counting towards your final exam score. So there will also be on Tuesday night a deadline for your final submission and we'll make up a final ranking based on the final submission that we'll reveal on Thursday in the last lecture, so Thursday 4.30. Um, one little hint. Um, if you participate in this on day one, your chances are very high to make it into the top 10 on day one. If you ever make it into the top 10, you get extra credit on your final. So there is a strong incentive here to at least quickly check it out the day it's released and submit some kind of baseline initial agent um, because likely you'll land in the top 10 because very few people will be as on top of it as you would be. And so maybe there are only 10 submissions on the first day and even a week submission will make it in the top 10. Of course, for the reason is to incentivize you to start early, but uh, in practice, not everybody starts early. You can count on that. Um, you'll be one of the few who starts early. Any questions about the contest? OK, 
Okay, then let's get started with uh, the technical topics for today. So today we're going to look at decision trees and neural nets. Those are alternative representations that we can learn from data to solve supervised learning problems. We'll also more generally look a little bit at um, some intuitions and theory behind supervised learning. And so that's what we'll do first. We'll start with formalizing learning a little bit and looking at consistency and simplicity. So the problem we're interested in is inductive learning. What does that mean? It means that you think there is some model that describes how your data would be generated. You don't have access to that model, but you're trying to find something as close as possible to that model from some set of models that you're willing to consider. Okay, so pictorial, what does this look like? It's a bit like doing signs, of course, where you don't know what, how the world works, but you assume some model and see how well it fits the data. So mathematically, you have some target function g. Let's say functions are represented by points on this slide, so every point is a different function. You have a function takes in an input, generates an output, and so you can characterize a function by all the input-output pairs that it would generate. Um, for example, you could have a scenario where you're classifying email and then the function g would go from the email to saying whether it's spam or ham. Could be another problem where maybe you're interested in pricing houses and get an estimate of what the selling price will be for a certain house. Um, then the input would be a house, which could be represented through a set of features like location, um, how large is it, and so forth which zip code it is in, and then g of x would be computing the selling price. Now the assumption here is that there is this function g, which will map any input to the desired output, but you don't know what g is. Instead, what you're getting is a bunch of data. You get samples, you get x size, and g of x size. And what you're trying to find is a function h that is as close as possible to g. And so maybe the set of hypotheses you're willing to consider is this set over here, and then the closest function would be this one over here. Of course, it's just a picture. It's not a way to actually find a function, but pictorially, you can think of it as there's some space in which all these functions live, and there is a set that you're willing to consider as your hypothesis space, and you pick within that hypothesis space the one closest to G. At least you hope it's closest. You actually don't know because all you get about G is training examples that give you some information about what G is. Okay, so the first example here is a classification example. The second example here is a regression example. Um, for the purposes of inductive learning and the way we're looking at it today, it doesn't really matter whether it's classification or regression. Um, so how do naive Bayes and perceptron fit into this picture? Okay, let's think about this. Um, let's start with perceptron. So perceptron, we said we're interested in making predictions of the type W transpose f of x, where f of x computes a feature vector from the input. So the hypothesis space H is the set of all functions W transpose f applied to some input x, and this is um, Perl W in R say k, where k is the number of features. So that's your hypothesis space. Any single hypothesis is a particular pick of w, and the hypothesis space is the set of all possible functions you have there available to you. How about naive Bayes? Um, what do we have there? We have a Bayes net, right, of a particular type with features one, two, up to k, and then a class label up here. So you can ask yourself the question, well, what can we represent this way? What functions that go from feature values to labels can be represented by this particular representation? Turns out it takes a little bit of math, but if you work through the math, it turns out that you can represent the same set of functions as with the perceptron. Um, you'll have 
something of the type um, W transpose, and it won't be f of x, but it'll be, well, it'll correspond to f of x in a somewhat complicated way, but effectively you'll have the log probability ratios, log probability of feature i given some label, y plus over probability the feature i given y negative. This here will effectively correspond to your wi. And then you'll multiply this with, if it's a binary setting, an indicator vector, or an indicator feature whether fi is equal to true or not. And so you'll have a sum over all i, which essentially sums over all your features, which could be one or zero, based on whether they're true or false, times some weight wi, which happens to be this thing over here. And then the prior will show up in some kind of bias term. Um, so this takes a little bit of math, but that's what it comes out as. So what's interesting here is that naive Bayes actually has the same hypothesis space as the perceptron. Um, it's following a different procedure to find its W, it actually doesn't directly try to find W, it tries to find these probabilities which implicitly will encode W. And so it's actually not finding the setting of W that's necessarily doing best on the training data. It has a completely different criterion to try to find its W, but it's still the same hypothesis space. We just end up picking typically a different hypothesis in that space when we fit the naive Bayes model than when we fit the perceptron. All right, so those are the examples we've seen before. Let's look at curve fitting, so regression. Um, one hypothesis space would be I'm only willing to consider lines, okay? And then maybe this is the hypothesis you'd find as the best hypothesis based on what you've seen here. Note that you don't know g of x. You've only seen some samples, and based on that, you're doing a fit. Um, Maybe you say, well, second order polynomials are fine. So you fit a second order polynomial and the best one maybe in your hypothesis space is this one. Maybe you say, well, I'm willing to consider even a bigger hypothesis space, maybe even something like a fifth or sixth order polynomial, you get something like this, or maybe even something much higher order and you end up with something like this. Um, so you can see depending on the hypothesis space you pick, you'll end up with a different result. And this is a little bit what we'll be thinking about right now. And the question here is one of consistency versus simplicity. Consistency refers to how consistent are you with the training data. Of course, in principle, you'd like to be very consistent with the training data, but it can come at a cost. You might end up with a function that's overly complex, that's overfitting to maybe some noise in the training data, and then doesn't generalize well to new data you haven't seen before. And to avoid that, you might favor simplicity and might look at a smaller hypothesis space where there maybe isn't as good a fit, as consistent a fit with your train data, but still a reasonable fit, and it's a simple hypothesis that you end up with, so more likely that you'll generalize well. Occam's razor refers to this principle where you want, among all the functions that fit your data, or fit your data reasonably well, you want to pick the simplest one. Of course, simple is not very precisely defined here, but intuitively you can think of it as, a first order polynomial is simpler than a second order polynomial, which is simpler than a third order polynomial. Um, and in general, the more features you allow for, the more complicated your hypothesis space. And so the more likely you'll be consistent with your training data, but also the more likely you won't generalize as well to your test data. So there's a fundamental trade-off here, which is often called the bias versus variance trade-off. What does this refer to? Remember we have this function g. We don't know what it is. We're trying to find some function h that's close to it. And the way we're trying to find it is by we get access to some examples x and g of x. And based on that, we're trying to find our function h that's hopefully close to g, right? You can think of what we're doing here as just one instance. We just got a set of x values and corresponding g of x. We then found our best h based on that. And now let's repeat this procedure. We again get a bunch of x's, we get the corresponding g of x's, and we fit the best h from our hypothesis space and see what we get. And we can keep repeating this. 
So what we have here is a random process where we randomly get a bunch of examples, it results in a hypothesis, and then we repeat this random set of examples results in a hypothesis. Yes? Um, we'll get to that, but that, that's a good point. Absolutely. Um, so the random process we're looking at here is that you get a random bag of training examples and the corresponding Q of X values, which results in a hypothesis. Now, as you do this, you get a sequence of hypotheses that's being generated, and you can look at the bias and the variance of the distribution over hypotheses. Variance is very straightforward, right? What is the variance? You get, first time you do this, you get a hypothesis. Second time you do this, you get a different one and so forth. You can now measure the variance of, let's say, the weights in the weight factor in this process. If the variance is high, it means you're probably overfitting because every time you get a new set of training examples, you came up with something different, All right? So hypothesis space is probably too large. That's high variance. On the other hand, it is possible that if you look at these hypotheses and you keep something as simple as a line as your only possibility, that you're always misfitting the data in a consistent way. You're maybe always getting the ones that are towards the outside of the spectrum wrong or towards the inside, or maybe always above in the middle and below on the outsides if it's really a parabola that's shaped up. And so the bias looks at across all these hypotheses you generate, what's consistently wrong about them? Right? And so if you have a very small hypothesis space, you'll often end up with something that's consistently wrong, and that means you have high bias. Now, the sweet spot is somewhere where you'd have about equal bias and variance, so you don't have too much bias, not too much variance, and you'll have to, as usual, look at some cross-validation or holdout data um, accuracy to decide what the right spot is to be. So that's the fundamental bias versus variance trade-off. Um, the question was, how do you measure closeness of these functions, right? Um, first of all, you never get access to G, so you'll never get to measure how close you really are to G. So the proxy that you'll use is ideally accuracy in your test data, but you're not allowed to look at your test data, so you'll have a holdout set, and you'll look at how well you do in your holdout set. If you do very well in your holdout set, it means you learn something that's reasonably close to the hidden function g that you never will see. Okay, so whenever we come up with an algorithm, usually they go for consistency. Not all of them, but many of them. For example, perceptron is a great example. You have a hypothesis and you get your training data and all you do is try to fit that training data. So you're trying to be as consistent as possible. Naive base is a little different because you're not trying to get classification error down, you're trying to fit something else but it's still trying to fit your training data as closely as possible. Um, so that's the preference of the algorithms itself, themselves for consistency. Now, to get then simplicity in your procedure, you actually need to do something somewhat external to the algorithm. So one thing you can do is reduce the hypothesis space. You'd say, well, I'm not gonna allow for too many features, for example. So you might select a subset of features you might make independence assumptions, such as is done in naive Bayes, which is effectively assuming every feature is contributing independently to the decision you're making, uh, which is a very strong assumption. But the nice thing is it makes your hypothesis space effectively smaller, and hence you, it's not really smaller in naive Bayes, but well, I guess it really, I should, I should have put this as we compare it to Perceptron down here. Um, so you can infuse other structural limitations which we'll look at soon. Now the other way to reduce the hypothesis space in a softer way is to essentially smooth out. As you run your algorithm, don't let it find values that are too extreme. So naive Bayes does that, and this should accordingly have been here. Um, it doesn't just fit your weight factor W based on what will do best on the training data. It says let's assume everything's independent and then have a fitting procedure based on that which will keep you further away from overfitting the training data. Um, another thing you can do is um, be careful with small counts. You don't want these extreme values, the zeros in the conditional probability tables. Um, we'll look at pruning today. Um, effectively what you're doing in a lot of scenarios, like for example, we looked at the support vector machine, which was a generalization of the perceptron. What we did there is we said, well, what you can do is you can try to find 
a decision boundary that has a large margin. So what you're doing there is you're trying to avoid having some extreme decision boundary that is kind of randomly positioned between your train data, but you're regularizing yourself, you're effectively reducing variance and less dependent on the exact training data you're getting and getting roughly the same weight factor out because you're always trying to look for one with the highest margin. Um, what we looked at on this slide is in a lot less detail than a lot of things we cover in this class. So we're not gonna actually try to test you on this in extreme detail, but the intuition here is actually really important if you're going to use any machine learning in practice that anytime you apply machine learning, you'll have to worry about this bias versus variance trade-off. You'll have to think about reducing your hypothesis space to account for otherwise maybe having too much variance. And you'll have to think about regularizing, that is, keeping your parameters away from extremes to avoid overfitting to the data, or as it's called on this slide, having too much variance in your procedure. Any questions about this first one third of lecture? Okay, then let's start looking at a new fitting procedure, decision trees, which is a good one to illustrate some of these concepts. So the example here is taken from uh, Russell and Norvig. What is this looking at? It's looking at a table where we have each row corresponding to an example. The columns here correspond to the features, also often called attributes in the context of decision trees. So the first feature is saying, we're trying to decide actually, so you walk into a restaurant and we're trying to decide whether the person walking in will wait to get seated or will walk out and go somewhere else. So that's what we're trying to predict. And we're trying to predict this based on some attributes of the situation. Is there an alternative restaurant or any kind of food place nearby that could be true or false? Um, is there a bar at the place? So maybe they'd like to wait at the bar, but not if they just have to stand around. Is it a Friday or a Saturday? Abbreviated to FRI, but it's, the attribute is actually whether it's a Friday or a Saturday, then well, another day of the week. Um, whether the person walking in is hungry, um, the patronage in the place at that time, does it look full, empty? Um, you might imagine if it's completely empty and you don't get seated, you would be more annoyed. Um, the price of the place, whether it's raining or not, whether you have a reservation or not, the type of food they serve, and the estimated waiting time that you're being told. Okay? So that's our problem here. Try to go from those attributes to a prediction whether a person will wait or not. Um, the example we'll be looking at here actually in the Russell and Norvig book, Russell is a Berkeley professor, as you might know, who wrote, I guess, a big part of that book. The data we'll be looking at is actually his data. He actually volunteered his own preferences into the book about his own way of making decisions. And we're effectively going to learn his preference relation here, whether to wait or not wait in a certain situation. Okay. So here is his decision tree. So this is actually the real, the real function G, which in future we won't have access to, but that's actually G. That's what Professor Stuart Russell would do when walking to a restaurant. You could go through this decision tree process and then predict what he'll do. Um, so what is this encoding? First, you'd ask the question, was the patronage none, some, or full? If none, and not being seated, well, then he wouldn't wait because it doesn't seem right to have to wait if everything's, every table's free. Um, if there are some, he'll wait. And if it's full, it'll depend on other attributes, what he'll do. It'll depend on the wait estimate. If the wait estimate is more than an hour, he'll leave. Um, if it's less than 10 minutes, he'll stay. Then if it's between 30 and 60 or between 10 and 30, it'll depend on another attribute. Now notice here that if we go down this branch, the next attribute is whether there's an alternate nearby, whereas down this branch here, the next attribute queried is whether he's hungry or not. So you don't have to follow the same order of attributes as you go down different branches of the tree. And so you can work your way down all the way here 
you'll reach some point where you hit the leaf and it's clear what the decision is. This is encoding a truth table, right? You can think of this as for all possible combinations of these attribute values, you can walk through, through this decision tree and find whether the answer is true or false. Now, a full truth table, if we look at this, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten attributes. Not a, some of them are not even binary, but let's assume they were binary, then there would be two to the ten possibilities, which is about a thousand. Um, there's even more because some of them are not binary. So a full truth table would be encoded in a large table, but here we have a much more compact representation of that same function. Now, decision trees are more general than needing to have a truth value at the bottom that's true or false. It could just as well be a conditional probability table. In fact, you could imagine that even at the end, it's not deterministic what the decision would be, and there would be a table there. Um, so there could be a distribution at the end in the leaves. There could be a regression happening at the end. So you could have something where you have some kind of split, and then at the bottom of the split, you fit a line to the data that satisfies that split, right? So there's different possibilities here of what you might encode at the very bottom. The true function, if really there's a truth, if you're willing to consider all truth tables, right, then this function can be encoded by a truth table. And so it's realizable it's in H, but of course we know that if we were to consider, if we got some data, we consider all possible tables, well, we'd have a very high variance procedure and we might not do well on holdout data. But in principle, either with a full table or with a decision tree, we can, we can represent any binary function on these attributes. Okay, so here's an example. Um, here's a truth table, and you can always re-encode this into a decision tree. There's actually a very simple procedure to do this. Um, it's not gonna give you compact trees, but you can first split on the first feature, then consistently split on the next feature, consistently split on the next, next feature, and so forth. You'll effectively, roughly in this order, walk through that table vertically slash horizontally in the, along the leaves of the tree. Um, so you can always represent any such truth table as a decision tree, but if you do it this naive way, your decision tree is just as large as your original table, and there's not much gain from doing it. So what you're interested in is, can we maybe find a compact decision tree, and by favoring compact decision trees, maybe we have a lower variance procedure where we have a higher chance of generalizing well to new data. So let's compare with perceptrons in terms of what we have here. So if we had this set of features here and we had a longer table, what could a perceptron represent? Well, a perceptron would be weight vector times feature vector, right? So it's a lot more restrictive. If you think of, for simplicity, you think of these as binary features living in some, in this case, 10 dimensional space, right? All the perceptron could do is find a hyperplane slicing that space in two halves, one side is true, the other side is false. With a full truth table, in that space, if you think of the hypercube, the 10 dimensional hypercube living in that space, you could model any labeling of true, false on any of the vertices of the hypercube. So it's a lot more expressive to have a truth table than just a perceptron. Intuitively, for a perceptron, a feature either contributes positively or negatively. There's a weight in front of it, and either it contributes towards more likely being true, that Stuart would be willing to wait, and well, more likely to be false, that Stuart would be willing to wait, right? And so there are no interactions there. There's no such thing as, oh, if the first thing is true and the second thing is true, then it contributes positively, but otherwise they each contribute negatively. To get that effect, you need to introduce additional features. So you could always do it and you say, well, I introduce a new feature, which is the end of two of the original features. And so to get a perceptron to be as expressive as a full truth table, you'd effectively have to introduce features corresponding to all combinations of these original features. Once you do that, it becomes just as expressive, um, but maybe not what you want to do in practice. We can imagine that you might want to introduce features corresponding to pairs or triples and so forth. Um, the nice thing about decision trees is that 
as we'll see, as we find a procedure to learn them, you'll see that that procedure automatically decides that structure of the tree and accordingly will decide which features are conjoined in some way where first you check for feature one, then feature two, then feature three, and it might even depend on the value they take on, right? So you automatically recover what feature combinations matter versus which feature combinations you don't have to consider as features. How about um, comparing to uh, naive Bayes? Well, in the decision tree, you get a much more complex interaction of features, right? You're looking explicitly at which features have some kind of joint effect on the result, whereas in naive Bayes, you explicitly assume features are independent and you cannot fit anything that violates that assumption because your structure of your base net is such that only independence between those features given the class label is allowed. Okay, so let's think about hypothesis spaces again. So how many distinct decision trees with n Boolean attributes? Well, many, we just talked about it. You can represent any function over those n Boolean attributes. So what does it mean to be able to represent any function? Well, if you have n Boolean attributes, you'll have a table that li can list all possible combinations. So that table will have two to the n entries. To specify one specific function, you'll have to specify two to the n entries. For every row in that table, you have to say true or false, right? Now, this is, the, this is the number of rows in that table. So the number of ways you can label entries in that table, for every row you can choose true or false. So it's two to the power, two to the n, different functions you have when you choose over the hypothesis space of all possible functions over n Boolean attributes. We know decision trees can represent all of them with that simple transformation going one attribute at a time. So with six Boolean attributes, there are, let's see, this is millions, this is billions, this is trillions. So I don't know what's next after trillion and next next, but this is a very large number of possible trees in our hypothesis space. Many more than we probably should be considering. Unless we of course have a lot of training data, in which case we can back up um, considering that many options. So you can ask yourself the questions, how many trees of depth one? These are called decision stumps. They're actually used quite a bit. Um, you're only allowed to split on one attribute, so you get a choice which attribute to split on, so that's n options there. Once you pick your attribute, um, if it's a binary split, you have to choose a true or false for the first branch and a true or false for the second branch. So those are two times two options, so we have a total of n times four different decision stumps that we can choose from if we have n features slash attributes. Um, so that's 4n, so with six Boolean attributes, this is 24, which is very different from this number over here. Of course, it might be a little too simplistic to only have one attribute on which you can split that would probably have a very high bias. Um, on the other hand, allowing to split on all would probably have a really high variance. It's something in the middle will likely be the right thing. Um, so the more expressive our hypothesis space, the more likely we can express the target function which is a good thing, but it also increases, and this is a simple counting argument you can make, it increases the number of hypotheses that are consistent with the training set. So the simple kind of binary true-false setting, you can say, well, if I'm willing to consider all of these hypotheses and I have only five training examples, how many of these hypotheses are going to be consistent with my training examples, right? It'll be roughly one over two to the fifth of them, let's say, because every, every training example essentially halves what's consistent with it. And so if you have only five training examples, you'd still have a large number, very large number of trees or tables that are consistent with them, and you'd essentially have to arbitrarily pick between those if you were willing to consider the entire hypothesis space. And so you somehow want a procedure that reduces variance. You don't want that many possibilities given your five training examples, and so that's why you might consider a smaller hypothesis space, maybe depth one, maybe depth two, depending on how many training examples you have. All right, so what does the procedure look like? Decision tree learning, you start with an empty tree, um, so let's not worry about 
the initialization here, but let's right away jump in here. If our set of examples, which is our training examples that we currently have, is empty, then we just return some default. That should not happen in the very beginning, otherwise we don't have anything to train on. Then, else, if all examples have the same classification, then we just return that classification label for that branch that we are currently in, in the tree that we're building. Otherwise, if the attribute set is empty, that would mean if you're, we keep track of attributes we've used so far in building our tree and we're kind of working our way down some branch in the tree, trying to see what subtree we should build there. We're at some point down in the tree, there are no attributes left, meaning we're already, already split on all the attributes, then there's nothing left we can do. This is the bottom of the tree. Whatever is there is a bunch of examples. If it's a mixed set of labels, you can just return whichever label is most frequent among that remaining set that's down that branch of the tree, and that's gonna be your prediction in that branch. Now, the most default case is that you'd have a bunch of attributes left to split on, a bunch of examples left in your current branch of the tree that you're building up, and you choose the best attribute to split on. That'll be the topic of the next few slides, what that means best, but you pick something that is supposedly best, um, and then you build a new decision tree that's rooted in your current point and that splits on that attribute. And then you loop over all values that attribute can take on and essentially make a recursive call. Like after that specific choice of value of that attribute, you need to build a subtree over there, which will be the recursive call. So you look at all examples that from your current set fall down that branch of the tree, pass them on in your recursive call, and that recursive call will return to you a subtree over there. Okay? So that's how you build these trees. Now, what does it mean to choose an attribute? Right? Let's say you start with, in this case, 12 examples, and you could maybe split first on patrons or first split on type. Okay? If you were to do that, you get a split that looks like this over here, like that over here. You might say, well, the one on the left looks better. I'd agree. The one on the left has a nice first branch with only red, middle branch only green, and then the last branch is mixed, but still favors red, so you still have a little bit of a prediction you can make that's somewhat reliable. Whereas the split on the right shows you that everything's still 50-50, so at this point, you get no benefit from knowing that attribute. It might be once you also know another attribute, combined it help, but just a single attribute doesn't do anything for making a prediction, right? So in this case, you'd pick this split over here. But the question is in general, how can we measure this? It might not always be that clear cut that one of them essentially gives you no information and the other one gives you some information and then you make the split because there could be many, many attributes and you somehow want to quantify. You have a single number, some kind of number, some score, score one and some score two. Compare these two scores and say, well, whichever split has the best score is the one we're going with. Okay, so we'll go on a little kind of sidetrack here in a sense that we'll introduce a new concept, which is actually really interesting, especially if you've not seen it before, but um, you could actually take a sequence of two or three classes on just this topic, which is information theory. Um, so we're going to reason about the amount of information that's present in some piece of data that we get, okay? So we're interested in quantifying if we get the information, namely the attribute for patrons, none versus some versus full, how much information are we really getting out of that? So let's look at some examples. Let's say there was a Boolean query and the prior in terms of answer to that query is half, half. Now, if somebody tells you the answer, how many bits of information do, do they communicate to you? It's one bit, because it could be been true or false. So it's like a zero or a one is enough to tell you which one of these two it's going to be. If it's a four-way query, and the prior is quarter, 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 and somebody wants to tell you what the answer is, they'd have to give you two bits. So you could zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. That allows them to distinguish between those four possible outcomes. Okay, so those are some simple cases. Now, let's make it a little more complicated. What if it's not a four-way question, but the prior is zero, 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 one? So this was one bit, this was two bits. 
How about this one here? Well, if you're trying to encode, so the, the game we're playing here is we need to come up with an encoding for answers to these questions that then somebody could use to communicate their answer. Right? The encoding for the first one was a zero and a one, depending on the answer. The second one was a pair of bits, depending on each answer, having their own pair of bits. Here, you know the answer is always going to be the last thing. Actually, you need zero bits. You don't need to encode anything. With zero bits of information, somebody telling you the answer, because you knew ahead of time that the probability is one that is going to be the last outcome. So nothing has to be communicated. How about a three-way question with a prior half, one-fourth, one-fourth? How could we set up an encoding scheme to minimize the number of bits that somebody would have to tell you once they find out the answer? So imagine there's this prior, somebody else somewhere else. You both know that prior. They get to see the outcome, and then they get to send you some bits to tell you what the outcome was. And you want to minimize the number of bits they have to send on average, because you don't know ahead of time what the answer is going to be. Let's think about this. Quite often, it'll be this answer, the first one. So maybe, let's call this outcome A, B, and C. Maybe we encode A with a 1. So if we get received a bit 1, we know it was A. Then we're left with encoding something for B and C. Um, well, they're equally likely. We can't use 1, because that doesn't really tell us what's going on, so maybe we should send a zero, but then we're not able to distinguish between the two of them yet, so then we'd also have to send maybe another zero here and another one here, all right? So what we have here is an encoding scheme where with this encoding scheme, we're able to communicate what the outcome was in an efficient way because we use less bits, only one bit for the likely outcome and more bits for the less likely outcome. Since that's generically going to be the scheme, you use very few bits for the likely things and a larger number of bits for the unlikely things. On average, if you look at this, on average, how many bits are you sending across? You're sending across half the time this, quarter of the time this, quarter of the time this, half time one bit, quarter of the time two bits, quarter of the time two bits. So we end up in this case with, on average, we send three halves of a bit. So that's how much we need to encode or to reveal the information if that's our prior. Okay? So this is a totally new concept, not related directly to anything we've seen so far. It's encoding the amount of communication required to reveal the outcome if ahead of time you have the distribution over possible outcomes. Okay? In general, um, if you have a uniform distribution of some size of, with p possible values, then each probability, if it's uniform, would be one over p, and then you'd encode each outcome with a number of bits, bits equal to log one over p. This is, would be a two log, because we're working with bits, and you kind of split on zero, one, zero, one, and so forth. So that's what you would lose, what you, you would use. In general, for any kind of distribution, roughly, you'd end up with encoding every outcome with log, of one over the probability of that outcome, making likely, likely outcomes having a short encoding and unlikely outcomes having a long, long encoding. Now, log two of one over p will not always be an integer. So to actually make this really work out, to make this precise, you have to think of the situation where you would repeat this experiment infinitely many times, and then in the limit, you'd have to send on average log two one over p bits for an outcome that has a probability p. Question? Correct. So the assumption, the assumption here is that you might send multiple, might send multiple messages in a row, and so if you send a one, followed by a one, you know it was twice an A, whereas if you send a zero and you don't follow it by another zero here, you just left it at as just a zero, then, at, then the one that comes after it, you wouldn't know whether it be the A that comes after it, then well that you were just sending a C. Um, and that fits in with the model of that really this model becomes applicable and, and precise once you send an infinite number of messages this way. 
Yes. It's going to be really important to the decision tree stuff, but right now there's no connection yet. All right, so the measure of the expected number of bits you need to send across, which is number of bits for an outcome with probability pi, we have a number of bits log two of one over pi, and then we take an expectation over how likely is each outcome. We can, that's actually probability pi. So this expression here is telling us on average how many bits do we need to send per experiment that we run where we get to see an outcome and want to communicate the result that we saw. This negative here is because the log of one over p is the same as minus the log of p, and that's, so p is in the top here, and that's why we have the negative over here. But this will be a positive quantity. Like if you compute this, this p is a number between zero and one, the log of p will be a negative number, and then take negative of that, you end up with a positive again. So entropy is a positive number, measuring how many bits on average you need to send um, with assuming you use the optimal encoding for your current distribution. So the first example, we had one bit of information was an equal split. Um, we had zero bits in the second example, and then we had a situation where sometimes we had to send more or less bits depending on what we are um, sending across. But on average, we had one and a half bits per message on the last situation. So a couple of properties of entropy. The more uniform your distribution, the higher the entropy, okay? So what do I mean with that? The more uniform your distribution, as you send the message in encoding the outcome of the experiment, the more possibilities there are, they're all pretty likely, and so the more bits effectively you'll have to send across. In the extreme case, when there is only one possible outcome, entropy will be zero because you don't have to send anything across. And then this is something in between. It's not exactly uniform, not exactly just one outcome. You get a half bit. The more values are possible, the higher the entropy, because the more possible outcomes you have. The more peaked your distribution is, the lower the entropy, because the more weight will be on one particular thing or a few particular things, which you'll encode with a small number of bits, which is only a few of them. You can use a small number of bits for those few and get these things across very efficiently. Um, Another interesting thing to keep in mind is that the rare ones almost don't count, right? Because if something almost never appears, you're waiting in here by its probability. So even if it has a long message, a large number of bits, it turns out that p log p or minus p log p is still pretty small, even for p become very small, right? Because you have two competing forces here. If you have, let's write it this way, pi log one over pi. As p gets smaller, this becomes larger, but this becomes smaller, and the way they interact is that overall, as p becomes uh, smaller, this quantity tends to become smaller. So the very rare things don't end up contributing a whole lot to your communication bandwidth that's required. Okay, so now we can tie this back into decision trees. For each split, we can look at the resulting entropy of the distributions that result after the split. And that will give us a precise measure of how much information we gained from doing that split. So we have a distribution here, same one here that we start out with. Those are uniform distributions, 50-50. That's as high an entropy as it gets. Then after the split, we have a low entropy distribution here, namely zero. Another low ent entropy distribution here is zero. And then here's something intermediate. It's not as bad as uniform, but it's not super peaked either, right? Whereas here, the entropy of all of these distributions is one, because it's a 50-50 distribution. So we have a one here, a one here, one here, one here. Here we have something between zero and one, some number. Um, can't calculate it by hand here, but it's something between zero and one. And so the left split is better than the right split. Split, Of course, there's multiple numbers. How do you compare them? You have to average them, right? So you say, I would take there's two here, so I take two times the entropy of this first distribution plus two times, oh sorry, four times the entropy of the second distribution, which is zero again, plus six times the entropy of the last distribution here. That would be the score for the left split. And for the right split, we'd have 
two times the entropy of the first one, which is this distribution here, plus two times the entropy of the second one, which is this one here, plus four times the entropy of the third one, which is this one here, plus four times the entropy of the last one, which is this one over here. And so now we have a single number for each split. We can compare those two numbers. Whichever one results in lower entropy is better, because that means we have to communicate less, we have had a better split, and that's the attribute we'll split on. Okay? So that's our procedure. And then you recurse, right? After you did the split based on the feature that gives you the most information gain, that is resulting in the lowest average entropy after the split, you look at attributes again, all the remaining attributes. Well, here you don't need to do anything, here you don't need anything, but here you still need to do some work. You look at all the remaining attributes, see what the information gain is. What's information gain? Info gain is equal to entropy before split minus the average entropy after the split. Now the entropy before split, of course, is the same no matter what attribute you split on, so that it's enough to just look at the entropy after the split to choose which attribute to go with. Okay. So here's an example of the procedure executed based on maximum information gain splits. We end up with this decision tree over here based on the data we had. Let's look back at the original tree over here. This is the tree Stuart Russell put in his book reflecting his actual preferences. It's a lot more complicated than the tree that we got out over here. So we're not going to make perfect predictions based on this tree, but it's still a reasonable tree to have. Even though it's not the perfect tree, we only had so much data. We had some 10 something training examples. We could not recover his full preference relation among what to do here from just those training examples. And this is a good tree or 12 exam based on these 12 examples. And it's doing well on the training data. We also have to worry about holdout data. We'll talk a little more about that later. But it's a reasonable outcome, even though it's not the exact one that's the true hypothesis. Okay, let's take a short break here. And then let's look at another example and how to deal with uh, regularization on that example. All right, let's uh, restart. Any questions about hypothesis spaces, decision trees? Yes. So the question was how to decide which attributes not to consider. So what this algorithm will do, it'll compute the information gain for each of the attributes. Then pick the one that gives you the most information gain. And so it'll guide you towards the attributes that are most meaningful, hopefully, unless there's something quirky about your training data. Um, now, to avoid overfitting, which is a related question, what if you are very far down your tree? And maybe at that point, it's not worth doing more splits because those attributes are not that meaningful. It's, you're just fitting to noise. Um, we'll get to that in a couple of slides. All right, so let's do another example. Um, here the example is to predict whether a car has good mileage per gallon or bad mileage per gallon. The attributes are the number of cylinders, the displacement, the horsepower, weight, the acceleration, the model year, and the maker. All right, so let's take a look at how this procedure would go forward. Um, we find the first split. What do we do? For each of the possible attributes that we could split on, so all of them for now, we look at what the split would what the split would look like over here. Then for each of those splits for these resulting distributions, here and then here and so forth, we can compute the average entropy among the over those distributions. And then from that, compute the information gain by differencing it with the original entropy in our distribution. And that's our last column here. 
and so we have the highest information gain, one of 0 0.5 for splitting on the number of cylinders. Okay, so we split on that. Here's our current tree. You can look at, we have the first branch, actually there's nothing going down that branch, you could just kind of, from the training data, you don't know what to do, but on your training data, you know that on average, bad is more often than good, so you'll carry over the kind of parent, this variable here, the parent's most likely label, and put that in there. Then here you'd predict good, because that's the majority. Here you'd predict bad, bad, bad. Um, two of them are still mixed, so you might want to do another split on those two. So you can, again, compute for every remaining attribute, once here and once here, those will be two separate calculations, what the information gain is going to be, and then you'll find what attribute to split on. The first case, it's the maker that matters, and the second case, it's the horsepower that matters. At this point, we're left with um, still a mixed bag over here and here. All the others are now very clean, at least based on the training data. So for those two, we now again look at each of the remaining attributes, compute information gains that you'd get based on them, pick the one with the highest information gain, split again. So here's what you end up with after doing this for a while. And then you kind of, it stops here. Why does it stop here? Every leaf node has just one category in it or no data in it, or this leaf node over here, no matter which other attribute you pick, it'll still be a one, one split in that these, there is noise in the data here, so to say our hypothesis space isn't rich enough, we don't have enough attributes, in that those are identical examples in our table, but they have a different label. So there's no way we can tease those apart. No matter how many attributes that we, for the ones we have right now that we split on, they'll always stay together. Okay, so that's what you have here. So no matter what you do, you look at maker, model year, acceleration, weight, horsepower, displacement, cylinders, it just, you'll still have that 50-50. They all fall, both of those fall into four cylinders, low displacement, medium horsepower, low weight, medium acceleration, 70 to, 70 to 74 model year, and a Asian maker, both of them. So no way from our attributes to distinguish them at all. Now you might say, well, this is kind of interesting. You build up this decision tree and you sometimes make splits where there is maybe only one or two examples left and you split on yet another attribute to kind of tease everything apart. Might we be overfitting, right? Well, we might. Um, we have to worry about noise in the training data. We have to worry about um, overfitting based on just a small number of examples and seeing a pattern in there that doesn't really exist, right? We've seen how to deal with this for naive bays, smoothing the counts. Naive Bayes also avoids overfitting by its strong assumption of independence. And then for the perceptron, the idea was early stopping. As we were training the perceptron, cycling through our, through our training data, look at the holdout error. And once the holdout error starts increasing again, we say, oh, we're now overfitting our training data. We should stop training, stop here. So maybe we should do something similar for decision trees, right? Imagine that you have a holdout set you try to keep track of the score in the holdout set, and then once the score goes down on the holdout set, gets worse, you say, well, okay, this split is too much because it's not really well informed anymore. Well, it turns out for decision trees, we want to do something that's slightly different even though the same intuition is behind it. Um, so if we look at this here, we are indeed overfitting. The test set error is 21% training set error, 2.5%. That's a clear indication we're overfitting, right? When you're doing the right amount of fitting, these errors should be about the same. Whenever training error is a lot lower than test error, you're overfitting. When it's the other way around, you got lucky somehow, that's actually not gonna happen very often. Um, so we're overfitting um, because we're looking at really detailed splits that just aren't worth doing it. Look at this here. We, we're splitting on horsepower and there is a, there are three examples in there. We have a three-way split. If horsepower 
had just no relationship at all with our label, it was just some kind of random bit that was set. You just said, I'm gonna just have a new attribute that's completely random. I'm gonna randomly set it to its first entry, second entry, or third entry. You'd also get a split where things get refined and you get lower entropy and, and it look good in what we're doing, right? So what we really wanna do here is somehow compare how much information gain we have to the information gain we'd get if it was a completely random feature and see what the difference is. And if a random feature would result in the same information gain, then that means that information gain is not worthwhile achieving. You should stop. Well, I should not stop exactly this way, but that's the intuition. Um, so what do you expect from a three-way split? Well, it's quite likely that they wouldn't all three still end up in the same bucket. And so there is some kind of, you could run a simulation in principle. You could simulate, if I did a three-way split that was a random split, what would be the information gain on average? And then compare that with what you actually have in your data. Okay, there's a test that you can run to do this in a more formal way. The star here means that you don't need to know what that test is, but if you need it at some point, you can look it up, um, chi-squared test and it computes a significance value. How significant is this split? Meaning how much non-random, well, how much more meaningful is it than if we had split on something completely random? Now, there's a little trick here with decision trees, which is, remember decision trees build up um, combinations of attributes as you work down your way down the tree. And so we're actually not just gonna early stop, we're gonna do something a little different. We're actually gonna prune from the bottom back up. The reason here is that sometimes if you split on a single feature, you might get no information gain or almost no information gain, but once you can split on two features after each other, all of a sudden things fall in place and it makes sense. And so when you look at just a single split, you might just see nothing meaningful. For example, if you're interested in Y being the XOR of A and B, on your first split when building a decision tree for this, you'd gain nothing. Because just knowing A or just knowing B tells you nothing about Y. But after the second split, all of a sudden, it's very clear what the pattern is. And so what we're going to do is we're actually gonna work our way down the decision tree all the way to the bottom, exhausting all possible splits. And then we're gonna start from the bottom and get, start getting rid of splits, like undo splits from the bottom up. In this XOR case, you would not undo any of those two splits because you'd see at the bottom that if you undo the last split, that'd be really bad. But if you had a split that was very low significance, according to that chi-squared value, you'd get rid of it and keep working your way up, pruning away the bottom of the tree until you hit some point where you think all splits now are meaningful. I cannot remove one um, without losing a lot of information. Okay. So. The pruning example here, if we did that for the um, car example, we'd end up with a training set error of 12%, which is higher than the 2% we had before. So we're not fitting our training data as well, but we have a test set error of about 16%, which is better than the 20, 21% we had before. And that's ultimately what we care about. So that was a good thing to do here to do that pruning. We would get rid of splits from the bottom up until we hit one that's significant and on all of the bottom branches and we stop pruning. In practice, when I say significant, that's a number. You could say, well, how significant was the split? But it's really hard to decide, should I be maybe significant with a score of 0 0.9 or 0 0.95 or whatever it should be? Luckily, in classification, the solution is actually quite simple. You have a holdout set, and you use your holdout set to decide whether you should get rid of the bottom most splits that you currently have in your tree. And so you work your way up in the tree, getting rid of splits at the bottom of that tree, as long as by doing so you improve holdout accuracy. And then at some point you get rid of a split, it, it's worse for your holdout accuracy, you don't do that, you keep it. Okay. So that's how we can control overfitting for decision trees. So to recap, the general idea here is that we have now two ways to control for overfitting. One way is to limit the hypothesis space, the set of things we're willing to consider. That would be limiting the max depth of the trees. That would be a reasonable thing to do to control for overfitting. It's easier to analyze because you can count how many hypotheses are in my hypothesis space. And given the number of examples, how much does that narrow it down? And is it reasonable to consider among that many? 
Often in practice, though, that's not the way to go, and it's, it's easier or it gives you better performance to do something that um, effectively just tries to keep you away from extreme hypotheses while still, in principle, considering a large hypothesis space. So we're in principle considering all decision trees here, but in practice, we're not going to end up with a very extreme decision tree that has a lot of splits because we are getting rid of splits that don't do well on the holdout data, and so we're being kept away from those extremes that overfit too much to our training data. Okay, so in the last 15 minutes here, uh, I want to switch topics to a different way of fitting data um, called neural nets. We'll get back to this in more detail in the lecture on computer vision, but I want to give a first introduction today, and then we can look at it again, then it'll sink in a little more deeply that way. Um, so what was the perceptron? That'll be our basic building blocks. We had inputs, which are feature values. Each feature has an associated weight that it gets multiplied with, and then the sum of those uh, weight times feature value gives you the activation of that unit. There might be a bias term that decides exactly where the cutoff is to be activated or not activated. So we have an activation, which is corresponding to a weighted sum of feature values. If the activation is positive, we output a plus one. If it's negative, we output a negative one. Um, sometimes people might output a one, a zero. It's effectively the same thing. You have a, going from a continuous value to a discrete value, your two categories, one, negative one, or one, zero. Okay? So that's what it looks like. You have a little check here, whether it's bigger than or smaller than zero, and that determines your classification output. All right, so that's perceptron. Now, how about we start combining multiple perceptrons together? So here's our perceptron that can do classification. Um, we need to feed in features, okay, which we might come up with somehow. But how about this new architecture here where we put a couple of perceptrons in front of it? Um, so each one of those is a perceptron. And now the idea is that rather than handcrafting our features, we're hoping that each of these perceptrons is generating its own feature, so to say. So the first one here is computing something based on the input. Maybe if it's an image, like is there an edge in the top right corner of that image? That's what it's classifying for. Then the next one might be classifying for, is there an edge in the bottom left of the image? Next one might be classifying for, is there a circle somewhere in the image? And then combined, once you know where there are edges, where there are circles and so forth, you might be able to make a decision based on whether there's a bicycle in the image or maybe a car or yet something else, right? And so what's happening here by connecting these together in this way, you are in this first layer having perceptrons that compute features for you, and then in the next layer, you are learning to make a decision based on these new features that came out of the first layer, okay? And so what a fully would look like is something like this. This is your original inputs. In this case, just three inputs in general would be much, many, much more, let's say 256 pixels or something, or even more, would be fed in here. They're fed into all of these perceptron units here, which then, based on their activation, define the features that go into the final classification unit. At the end here, what we have really is a function, a hypothesis, that we're, once you fix the weights, so there are weights here, and there are weights everywhere here on all of these connections. So we have three times three weights in the first layer, another three weights in the second layer for a total of 12 weights. So our hypothesis space is all functions that can be represented by this architecture, which will be a 12-dimensional space because we have 12 weights we get to choose from. And every point in that 12-dimensional space will correspond to a function that maps from inputs to a classification. Right? So what we want to do now, we want to learn that 12-dimensional weight vector W. Right? So the way we do that is we say, well, we have some training examples. We have an objective, which is we want our output to be close, well, our produced output from our function to be close to the label. Let's penalize for maybe squared deviation from the label, and we'll find the vector w, in our example, 12-dimensional vector w that minimizes this score, so minimizes prediction error. We already know how to do something like this. We saw hill climbing back when we were looking at CSPs. Uh, we said, well, you can kind of tweak around uh, your variables, the values they take on, see if it's better, find a setting that's better, then 
pick another variable, change it a little bit. If it's better, keep it and keep repeating this until you land in some kind of local optimum where in whatever direction you move, it's not going to get any better. So you might return that, right? So what did it look like pictorially? Effectively what it looked like, this hill climbing procedure was, you start wherever, so in your 12 dimensional space, you pick some choice, some value for each of the weights. This puts you somewhere in this landscape. This landscape, of course, is only for a two dimensional optimization problem, as I'm trying to visualize here, but imagine it's 12 dimensional. And so what you're doing then is you're locally looking around, you're saying, what if I perturb my weight vector a little bit in any possible direction? You reevaluate for that perturbation how good would I do on the training data? And then among all possible directions you could move into, you pick that direction that improves your score the most on your training data. And you repeat this. Pictorially what that means is you're on this mountain, it's complete, it, there's so much fog you can't see anything, but you're on the mountain, you wanna find the top, and you just feel around you, you feel which direction is steepest uphill, if you wanna go uphill, and you make a step in that direction, and then again you feel around, see whatever is the steepest direction uphill, you make a step, keep repeating this, okay? So that's hill climbing. Um, is it a complete procedure, meaning is it guaranteed to find a solution if one exists? Well, it's guaranteed to find some kind of solution in that you're guaranteed to end up in a place where there is no direction in which you can improve anymore, but there are many cases where that's not where you want to be. You could be in a local maximum if you're trying to go uphill where, yeah, it's a peak, but it's a very small peak compared to the top you really want to be at. You could be at a place where it's completely level and in no directions can you find improvement like over here, but really you should actually keep going, but you don't know that because you feel around yourself and it's all flat. You don't know which direction to go. In this drawing, you might say, well, it's either left or right, but in 12 dimensions, it's a lot of directions to walking, you might need to go a long time before you realize there's actually some upside in that direction. So what's particularly tricky for the perceptron? So let's think again about what we're doing here. We're solving this optimization problem, trying to find a better choice of our W vector locally based on looking at this architecture here and how well it's predicting the labels in our training data. Any thoughts? Why this is gonna be very, very tricky to get to work? Well, let's take a close look at what we have here. So this is our network. If we make it more explicit, what happens in those testing units, we go from a real number to either a zero or a one or a negative one plus one, depending on how you encode it. So if you look at this, if you make just a small change to any of the weights, that usually will not change the threshold of the output. Because the threshold of the output is either zero or one and it can be require a large change to your weights before that actually changes. And so what you see here is that effectively in a network like this, pretty much everywhere you are, it's flat. And then every now and then there's a little jump up. And so you get effectively no information about which direction to move in. All right, the problem is of course these things here. They take away all that gradual information and make it a threshold version of that information. So when you do these multi-layer perceptrons, what you need to do is you need to actually smooth that out. So rather than going, jumping from zero to one, which gives you a landscape that is effectively flat everywhere with small jumps, by making this a gradual transition, now your landscape will be smooth. You won't have those jumps and you will have a way to find a direction in which you can improve no matter where you are. It's a little more subtle than that because it is true if you are towards the end of the spectrum here, it gets pretty flat and so while not 100% flat, it's still close to flat, so it's a little tricky there to make progress. But as long as you're usually in this middle regime, at least for some of your training examples for each unit, you will be able to make progress with this local procedure. So some properties of neural nets. Um, one property is that they're universal function approximators. What does that mean? If you have a two-layer neural net, so once you make those perceptrons into smoothed out units, they're neural nets. Um, so if you have a two layer neural net with sufficiently many first layer units, you can approximate any continuous function arbitrarily closely. And the more units you have, the closer you can get. So this means that you have a large hypothesis space if you have a large number of 
uh, first layer units. Of course, you need to be careful about that. You might overfit. So we know what the flip side is of having a very rich hypothesis space, but at least we know that we can approximate complex functions if we want to. So if we have enough training data, we know we can get a complex function being fit this way and get it to be close to what the training data says. So in practice, one way to think of this is that you are now learning the features. Because if you're training this multi-layer network, you're not just training the last layer anymore, which is your classifier in some sense, but you're also le learning the inputs to that last layer. And so rather than needing to hand design features, saying, oh, well, let's combine attribute one and two or two and three into a new feature, this will, in this first layer, come up with those ideas for you based on what the training data is telling you. Um, keep in mind the danger of overfitting. The standard thing to do there is have a holdout set, right? You will fit to your training data, but keep track of your accuracy on your holdout data. And once that accuracy gets worse on your holdout data, you're starting to overfit. So stop overfitting, just stop your training right there and see how well you do at that point. Um, it is true that you can still get kind of stuck in bad local optima um, because, or plateaus quite often, because towards the ends here, things are pretty flat for all of those units. So there are some things we'll look at in the vision lecture where we look, we'll look at kind of large scale learning of these things for uh, classifying what's in an image. There are some things we can do, anybody can do really, and just need to follow the right procedure to um, deal with this at least to some extent. Um, but either way, initialization will be important. It's always possible that you have a bad initialization. So for a problem like this, if there are multiple local optima, you need to be careful about initialization. If you have a good way to initialize, that's great. Just go with it. If you don't have a great way, randomly initialize multiple times and see which initialization leads to the best results. All right. Um, this is what we covered today. Starting next lecture, which will be next week, Thursday, we'll start looking at advanced applications in natural language processing, computer vision, and robotics. Good luck with your uh, midterm on Monday.